morning, friends. I, I'd like to welcome you to this lecture today, which is uh, on the ideas of India by Mr. Vigil Sharma. Uh, he is a, he's trained as an economist and political scientist in St. Stephen's College, the Indian Statistical Institute, and Harvard University, and now works as opinion editor of the Business Standard newspaper and lives in New Delhi. I stumbled upon Mihir's work through Professor Ashutosh Vashne last month. He had come here to deliver a lecture, and uh, later when he went back, he sent me an uh, email saying that you must read what uh, Mihir Sharma has written about my book and four other four, five other books. And um, this was a book called The Battles Half One, India's Improbable Democracy. And he had reviewed this book along with uh, Sudhir Khilnani's idea of India and the whole thing. And actually what grabbed my attention in this whole thing was the first line that he had written in that uh, critique, in the review of his, which said, how does one stuff a country into a book? So I said, this is really, I mean, if somebody can write like that, we definitely have a lot to say about so many people stuffing the country into books. <laughs> That's not only Ashutosh. So I said, I must get him here, and then I talked to Ashutosh, and I said, uh, you know, give me his contact details, and Ashutosh is kind enough, you know, he knew all your details all your mobile number and everything as he gave me and that's how I got in touch with him and uh, well, here he is. So I hope he will not throw more light on this, uh, on this, what he exactly, did he gave the idea, he said I'm talking ideas over here. So this is not going to be a, a, a you know, a talk, I mean, people have, you know, actually some people ask me, is it going to be what, is it going to give ideas about India? <laughs> you know, have you had enough of that? <laughs> you don't want that. I said, no, I don't think it's going to be as boring as that. And being a journalist, I'm sure he's not going to bore you at all. You know, so please welcome him with a round of applause. <laughs> uh, we are also very happy to have with us Dr. Deepa Narayan, who will chair today's session. Uh, Dr. Narayan is an independent international poverty, gender, and development advisor and writer with over 25 years of experience with the, working at the UN and NGOs. She served as Senior Advisor in the Vice President's Office of the Poverty Reduction Group of the World Bank. I could not think of a better person to chair the session on this because she has also worked with uh, Ashutosh Vashne. So I said, I mean, there is some kind of a link somewhere, so <laughs> I couldn't think of anyone. So kindly welcome Dr. Deepa Narayan. Delight to be here this morning. I, since uh, Nandini has already introduced uh, me here, I think a great way to start is just to read out the first paragraph of the column that Nandini uh, is speaking about. Uh, so how does one stuff a country into a book? Those of us in the book reading trade are frequently called on to address this question. Those in the book writing trade a far more confident set of individuals, some things we downtrodden reviewers are continually reminded of by author photographs that grow ever more distinguished and glamorous, usually know the answer. Some follow the traditional or Napoleon route, travel the country, meet a few people at roadside stalls and Tony dinner parties, and deduce grand and important things about the future from what they say. Or, in some cases, what they don't say, or should, in the author's opinion, have said. Others, like Mr. Nightfall's biographer, Patrick French, choose instead to write careful reportage, picking a few incidents, people or places that they think are illustrative. The problem in this case is, of course, that you can endlessly quibble over a choice of incident, person or place. Or you could write a big book of ideas on the assumption that, in the end, all countries are ideas anyway. That's the gold standard. So very Kilnani's The Idea of India, so very influential in the decades after its release, that it's now used as a term of abuse online for those insufficiently deferential to aggressive Hindu nationalism. Uh, and then he goes on to say, I personally have given up on all these and usually turn to novels. So I'm sure we're in for a fascinating discussion. <laughs> Over to you, and then I'm going to ask him a few questions because I had a lot when I read this, and then throw it over to discussion. 
Okay. Um, so the way that I thought we would do this is that I would um, chat briefly about what it is that we fight about. Now, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's very easy for us uh, to look at the many disputes that roil our politics and our country every day and not exactly trying to work out exactly why these are unsolved questions and uh, why it is that we expect the state to change or the Indian government to change in some way and not in another. What are the ways in which we want to put pressure on it? What are our various different ideas of India? Where do they clash? What are the unworked out things that still remain to be sorted? And um, I won't say where do we go from here because I have absolutely no idea, but I'm sure all of you do as, as a group and that's, I suppose, how we'll end it. Um, so I sort of, I, I, I listed out, um, and I have actually, I've, I've previously thought about this, but I listed, I listed out seven different big divisions, some of which are obvious, some of which are not so obvious. And each of them has a different effect, in my opinion, on how it is that we want the state to be. So all of us know that we're Indian but we have different identities that come into conflict with each other, sometimes within one person. And we want our state to reflect these identities, but not everybody shares them. So that's where, it's also for, uh, that's where a lot of these questions come from. Now, the first two that I'm going to talk about, <coughs> everyone understands, and that's religion and, that's geography, and the other is geography. We all know that these have an impact but I'm just going to twist them slightly in a bit. Um, and the remaining five are caste, language, and, uh, and uh, two other things that, the words will sound odd, but I'll try and explain them a little better, but materialism and age. Okay, so bear with me. We'll get down. Right. Um, so religion, we all know that we, have, we come from different religions. We all, we all know that religious conflict is one of those things that is supposedly endemic in India. It has been for many centuries. I, I think that um, we've lived together. We've also lived separately and at daggers drawn. So it, it hasn't been harmony all the way. Um, <coughs> The question is, these divisions um, of uh, religion, how is it that they are reflected in the state? Now, you know, we, we all know that India is supposedly a secular country. We all know the, the various pitfalls and the various gaps in Indian secularism. Um, the interesting and important thing about it is that I think that the state has inherit, essentially inherited the British approach to managing religion, which is all we need to do is to basically manage conflict and prevent it between these two homogenous groups or many homogenous groups of people. And I think that's led to, that is precisely what's led to a lot of the trouble. Because first of all, if you have a state that starts with the assumption that everyone in a particular religion thinks the same way, then you're going to start forcing them to think the same way. And the second is that if you are a state that begins to focus on managing conflict between groups of people, you are basically recognizing that the natural state of these two groups of people, or these many groups of people, is conflict. And you start becoming a neutral or a pretend neutral arbiter between them. And that's where the Indian state has run into a lot of problems in the past. You know, you're know, you going to try and work out exactly who owns title to a group or to a particular spot of land in Ayodhya, but not on the basis of property law, on the basis of some other kind of complicated political slash religious uh, uh, methodology. If you read the Supreme Court decision on the Babri Masjid case about three years ago, four years ago, it's very, it's quite extraordinary 
because one third of it is taken up with, with a definition of exactly who a Hindu is. And to end with the point of, okay, this is how we describe what a Hindu is, and therefore this is why Ayodhya, the Ayodhya dispute is important. I was really not sure at that point in time whether the Supreme Court should be telling me or anybody exactly what you know the, 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 the parameters of my religion are and what I believe. Um, and we have, admittedly, it's difficult for the state to keep out of religion in many ways because sometimes I feel that we may be the most religious country in the world. Um, I have not been to, I've never seen anywhere else in the world, not even most Islamic countries, where the top, you know, seven of the top ten TV shows at any given point in time are religion, are religion themed. And that's been the case in India now for the past seven to eight years. It's like, there, there, sometimes I feel that you know between eight and nine you have a choice of mythology and reality shows and maybe I'm not going to come here. It's 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 quite tiring. Um, but so yes, obviously we are a very religious country and it's difficult for the state to get involved, but uh, to, to avoid getting involved. But the fascinating thing is that the state has, while trying to be this arbiter managed to interfere in religion as well. There's this lovely uh, um, set of discussions that have been written about secularism in the United States and how it came up. And, um, you know, the, the founders of the United States were, some of them were, if not atheists and at least agnostic, and some of them are very religious indeed. But the one thing that they managed to agree on was that um, the state should have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Uh, what's called the Establishment Clause, that you know, the state shall have no established religion. And at some point, somebody asked, I think Thomas Jefferson, um, and he said that, you know, this is, uh, he said to him, this is a wonderful way to protect the, the state from the influence of religion. So Jefferson looked at him for a while and he said, it's also to protect religion from the influence of the state. And even if you have a majority religion like we do, the impact of state power is something, you know, the states run temples, all right? The state tells you, as I said, what it means to be a Hindu. It pushes one idea of what the Ramayana is down everybody's throat, for example, which a lot of people in the South are not completely happy with. Um, and this is, in many ways, I feel, we know that secularism is a problem, but we look at it the wrong way. And it's one of those ideas of India that we know exists. We are secular, but we're insufficiently secular. But we're not going to solve that problem because we keep on thinking of secularism as Gandhi thought of secularism, which is you know, an equal attitude to all religions. Whereas actually successfully secular states are those in which the state tries to stay away from all religious dispute and all and treat them all as only as pure law and order problems. And that's never something that we've done here ever since the British, or at least never ever since eighteen fifty seven. And it's something that maybe causes a lot of the trouble which we see. The second point that um, the second way in which we divided of course is geography. And geography is somehow slightly subtly different from ethnicity. As we've all discovered over the past, you know, fortnight and three years, when you discover that two halves of what used to be Andhra Pradesh don't actually like each other very much, for reasons that are not in the least obvious to outsiders. All right, uh, till four years ago, I think a lot of us had absolutely no idea that there was any such thing as a Telangana identity. Till a few years ago, till even you know, to, to even uh, uh, um, later than that, we had no idea that they detested each other so much. And to some of us still, it's a little mystifying. They speak the same language. They have, uh, you know, by and large, broadly the same culture. I keep on being told that there are, there are subtle differences in the fish curry, or, uh, you know, the accents are ever so slightly different. But, oh, you know, these are, this is the kind of thing that you can get within families. And, Admittedly, we, you know, I disagree about my fish curry with my mother, who puts in too much red chili. But it's not something that we come to blows about. So, part of the reason I think is that the, the geography has started playing more of a role in how we start thinking about India, is that we're just so much more populous now than we used to be. 
Um, you know, there are lots of there are lots of studies that come to various conclusions that can be endlessly questioned about the ideal size of a government, about the ideal size of the state. I don't think there's any such thing, but one broad rule is probably that as a country becomes more densely populated, the ideal size of an administration is smaller geographically. I think that's not very difficult to work out. So in the first 15 or 20 years after independence, nobody looked at Uttar Pradesh and said, this is clearly an unmanageably large place. But now, even though, that you've, even though you've taken away Uttarakhand, it's still unmanageably large. I think you know, Noida has completely different problems from Banaras. Um, and of course, chief ministers of Uttar Pradesh famously don't even visit Noida because they're convinced that um, it is so different from the rest of UP that it immediately, immediately leads them to lose the elections. And I wish I was making this up, but it's completely true. There were four chief ministers in the 1990s of Uttar Pradesh who visited Noida to campaign, and all of them lost the elections that they were standing for. And since then, no chief minister of UP has visited Noida. Um, it's a combination of, uh, of superstition and a genuine lack of interest in something that appears so far from the rest of, of, of the state. So yes, as you grow more populous, the national size of, of, of uh, you know, administrative groups seems to get smaller. But what is interesting here is that it isn't always a region versus region thing. What we've seen in, for example, Telangana, we see sometimes in, um, in other places like Bengal, where I grew up, North Bengal versus South Bengal, and the hills, and the hill districts of Darjeeling versus uh, both North and South Bengal. But more often than not, and this is something that we don't always notice, it is region versus center. And in many ways, I mean, the election that we're going into is one that is, in many ways, going to be fought on precisely this basis. Is it going to be some, uh, 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 is our politics a centralizing, Delhi-based, national politics? Or is it something that takes place in various states, even in national elections? And um, we are often told, for example, that there are two national parties, the BJP and the Congress. And I grew up, as I said, in Bengal, which, is, which doesn't have the BJP at all. You know, it gets 4% of the vote, maybe 10% in wave years, but it's never won a seat in its history in Bengal. It's never won a municipality. It's never won a ward. Um, so the question really is, I mean, can you be a national party while only being restricted to the north and the west of the country? And furthermore, we think of the BJP as a national party because we believe it has one single identity everywhere it is, whatever it is you know, related to a sort of broad Hindu revivalist, culturally nationalist, an RSS kind of identity. But is that actually true? Everywhere that the BJP has gained success in the past 15 years, it has done so on the back of being a particular kind of state party. So in Karnataka, it became the party of a particular caste group, the Lingayats, right? It organized around Lingayat social organizations. It organized around Lingayat religious organizations. It put Lingayats in positions of power. And as it happens, the Lingayats had always been politically powerful in Karnataka. And the BJP basically allowed for a political mobilization of this politically powerful caste. Similar things have happened in Gujarat, where you know, the BJP has essentially developed a social coalition, and in, many, in some parts of Gujarat, poached it from the Congress, which leads it to have, in, in, within the Gujarat BJP, to have entirely regional preoccupations. In, as somebody in the Gujarat BJP once told me, the only person in the Gujarat BJP who thinks nationally is Narendra Modi. And this isn't a surprise because across the places where the BJP is powerful, with a sole exception of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, the BJP does not think 
like the Congress does. It does not look to Delhi. It does not think of itself as having a national ideology. It is primarily answerable at the local level to local interests and is in many ways a coalition of local parties. This is why we're always told the difference between the BJP and the Congress is one is a high command party which is centralized. And this is not only a product of the fact that the Congress is ruled by a particular family. It's a product of the fact that the Congress does not necessarily see individual states as being the location of politics. For the Congress, everything happens in Delhi. For the BJP, things happen at state levels. And of course, that is completely the case with regional parties as well. So one of the basic tensions that we've seen over the past 20 or 25 years is this tension between Delhi and the states. And in many ways, the states have won. The reason I believe that the the last Congress government completely failed at administration was that so many things that it wanted to do, it discovered it couldn't because they were in the power of the state. You want to fix environmental control, you want, uh, you know, one way or the other, that's, that's by and large up to the states. You want to fix how, um, you know, the police are taken care of. That's again a state subject, except in Delhi. And all of the, you know, it's, there's a fascinating um, speech that Manmohan Singh gave in 2004, shortly after he um, became uh, Prime Minister, to a group of, I think, um, IAS officers. And if you go down it, it's like, that's incredible. He's laid out 10 things he wants his government to do, but 8 out of 10 of those don't depend on Delhi at all. And we're accustomed to thinking of Delhi and the Prime Minister and you know the Parliament in Delhi as being able to solve various things. But actually, we are a much more structurally state-based country than we imagined. And the reason that we haven't noticed this is because we've typically had powerful prime ministers who can call up chief ministers and push them to do their bidding. That doesn't exist anymore. Every single chief minister is a little dictator in their state. And you know, it's not just Narendra Modi who is known you know, to be able to change his IS officers at will. Um, Nitish Kumar is just the same. You know, every single bureaucrat in Patna is terrified of him. Um, Jalalitha is the classic example of somebody who basically rules a fist with an iron thumb and has giant photographs of her, you know, everywhere. And where I come, again, Calcutta, uh, Mamata Banerjee is no in, in none of these states. Typically, can you name a single other politician who's not in opposition? You can't name another member of the cabinet. And that's because they're all one-man states and one-man, eventually one-person one parties. Um, there's a friend of mine who um, is working for the Narendra Modi campaign. And I once asked him, you know, what is it like talking to him? So he talks about lots of different things. And then he paused for a while and he said, you know, the very fascinating thing is that you have never heard him mention another politician. I've heard him talk about bureaucrats he worked in. I've heard him talk about various other things, but he has never said, you know, so and so minister got this done. He's never mentioned another politician, and that is the way that state governments operate now. They're one man things, or one person things. You come to Delhi and you discover that things don't work like that. And so, which is why we see states are a lot more effective, and there's this strange state versus center thing that keeps on going. Okay, and number three, um, language. Now again, I'm not going to talk about the standard approach that we've always thought about for language, which is one Indian, one indigenous language versus another, where, you know, in Goa, obviously, for many, many years, there were battles as to exactly what, what the language of the state should be. And this is something that broadly... And one of the things that I find fascinating is that we seem to have worked it out, not just locally, but overall. Uh, nobody, nobody in the South feels as threatened by Hindi as they did in the years immediately after independence. But in spite of the fact that Hindi is perhaps more broadly spoken in the South and in parts of the South now than it was in 1955. Um, Nobody in, 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 in Bengal feels threatened by, uh, by, by Hindi. Nobody in... There are some places where language maps into ethnicity, like Assam. So in Assam, people are threatened by Bengali, but not because they're threatened of its 
of its cultural power, but because they feel threatened about being overrun by Bengali speakers, whether or not that's true. So the language versus language thing that we thought would be such a feature of our country has actually died away. But the division I actually want to talk about here is a sort of strange one, and that's between indigenous languages like Hindi, Konkani, and Bengali, and English. And here's, it, it's something that I've always found very puzzling because obviously our idea of our state is something that speaks the language that we grew up speaking, which is in most cases for us, you know, Hindi, Bengali, Konkani, or something like that. But in effect, what we actually want out of our lives and for our children, and you see this in every, I've seen this in every state I've gone to, across every social class, is English. Personally, we want to speak. We want the, the opportunity to speak in English. We complain, all right? Everyone complains, oh, you know, it's tough now for Hindi speakers, but there's no question. My son or my daughter has to learn English. The, you know, if, they, if only they had, if only I had learned English, English properly, if only I learned English at a, at a younger age, if only I spoke English better, if only I knew English at all, you know, my life would be better in X, Y, Z. A, B, C kind of way. This is something that I hear over and over again. And I find it fascinating that this is somewhere, something where the idea of India clearly conflicts with the idea of what Indians want in their lives. There's a, there's a broad consensus that our state should not give any support to this, this, this you know, should be supporting Indian languages. All right? But in our own lives, we will be dashed if you want to do anything to do with Indian languages. All right? You know, we we want we want to make sure that we speak an international language. The only international language we have we have on board. I think uh, we, uh, we can access it's English. And this is something which I feel a I can't understand why why no political entrepreneur has managed to figure out. Um, you know, across states, people keep on raising the the age at which English is taught in public schools, thinking it's a popular move, and discovering it's not. And Across, you know, even the Aam Aadmi Party, which now we talk about as you know the next great hope for a particular um, for those of us who are disillusioned with with politics of one way, one kind or another, even the Aam Aadmi Party um, has picked this up. And um, for example, Yogendra Yadav um, recently in an interview said, "There's too much English that's used by the by the government. We have to cut down on the use of English completely because the Aam Aadmi does not speak English." And the answer to this is, is of course, yes, the Aam Aadmi may not speak English, but the Aam Aadmi really, really wants to. And I'm going to leave this open. I, I mean, I'd love to hear what, what people think about this, but this is a clear place in which, in many ways, I think the idea of India has failed. We solved our problem with fighting over language, but there is this one crucial gap between us and our government, which we haven't been able to close. Right. Um, Right, I'll take five. Um, I'll just talk briefly about three more things that I feel are very interesting um, and divisions between that that lead to different and that have different impacts on the Indian state. One is, well, I, I, what I've written here is villages, but essentially what I mean is urbanization. Now, we've always been told growing up, the first line of my geography textbook in class six was three fourths of India lives in villages. All right, and then. Sure enough, very, very carefully, three-fourths of that book went on to talk about India's villages. Um, obviously, Indian villages aren't the same now as they have been for many years. A lot of people have uh, access to things that we associated only with cities, particularly television. They're a lot more connected to the rural, to the urban world than they are than they were, you know, ten years ago even. Um, the roads are better, TVs there. Transport is, is better. People move back and forth with far greater ease. Um, but the very interesting thing is, to me at least, that as a, as a country, we're really, really schizophrenic. As, as a state in particular, as, as, a, as a political people, we're really schizophrenic about what we think about villages. Right? Ever since Gandhi, we've had this utopian idea that um, villages are the location of virtue, and you know, things are, you know, just perfect there. There was this line by Dinkar, I think, 
it was that you know if there wasn't a want of education, the Indian village would be paradise. And um, I this is usually something that city-based people I think tend to believe. Um, um, I am yet to find any person from a village says, "Oh, this place is paradise," and it always has been. Okay, uh, but the the thing is that we were shaped by Gandhi and by lots of other people who had a very utopian view, as I said, of what a village should be. And we still inherited this in our public policies. So the Indian state works very hard to keep people in villages. All right? We have the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is maybe a good idea, maybe a bad idea. But here's the crucial part about it. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to give you some basic income um, if you don't, if you, you know, if you're starving. But the moment you move away from your home village, you can't access it. All right. Pretty much every social welfare scheme that looks at India, uh, that, that India is poor, is tied to a particular geographic location for you. you move, the moment you move away from it, you can't access it anymore. This is what I mean. And, 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 and if you tell people who worked on this scheme, some of whom are very smart, they say, yes, but that's the point. We have to allow people to have income in the places where they grew up because they really want to live there. And I am not certain that this is true at all, actually. Um, the other thing is that it, it, it has always been amazing to me that no political party wants to really focus on towns. All right? No political party will come out and say we are an urban party, or that living in a town is a natural way in which Indian, a natural way in which Indians should live. All right? The Congress, as I said, is in love with this Gandhian image of what villages are like. So is, in many ways, the Amadhi Party, Amadhi party which wishes to empower every single local panchayat. At a, at a, to a massive degree. Um, the BJP believes in an idealized form of hierarchical village life. The sole exception to this rule is one party um, which came into power in a, in a large state recently, you know, in the past decade. And the first state, the first speech that the chief minister of that party gave was on the subject of towns. And she said that I am going to pick the 50 largest towns in in my state, and I am going to give them a modern sewer system. I'm going to give, I'm going to build additional extensions to them, and I'm going to encourage people to move to towns. And that was the first time that I'd heard a political leader say this: encourage people to move to towns. And um, the answer, perhaps, is that it, the, the, the person who gave this speech was Mayawati of the Bharatiya Samaj Party. And I, I think it takes a Dalit party to come out and say that you know actually. Villages, not cool. They aren't the best place to live. They're sort of tough. Everybody knows that your great-grandfather, who your great-grandfather was, and what they did wrong. And a lot of people like to move and leave that behind. And Maya was the first person to tap into that. And I thought that was pretty impressive. And which leads us easily into the one thing that makes us unique is, which is, uh, in terms of division, which is caste. And here, the only thing that I'm going to say about caste and the thing that I find fascinating is it makes us unique as a culture, as I said, but it also makes us uniquely blind because this is the only division in the world where I notice one side, within quotes, likes, likes to pretend that the division doesn't exist anymore. Um, so, you know, in the, a the average drawing room, if we sit down and say, you know, um, and of course we're divided by, ca divided by caste, and they look at you, completely shocked. It's like, how can you, you know, for years I didn't know what caste you were. And I said, yes, the moment you say you don't know what caste you are, everybody knows what caste you are. All right? <laughs> and uh, it's, we have those of us who were born upper caste, or at least with upper caste names and markings and distinguishing features of one kind or another, have find it very easy to say, you know, it's, I don't understand why we're still talking about caste. It's 2013, 2014, man, get a life. All right, and the answer is that most of us have never been told by anybody, oh, you are X, you, are, you belong to this caste, and so obviously this is what you're like. Because 
is not something that's common in um, our upper, upper caste, our nice background. But for a lot of other people, that's a daily feature of their lives. And so it isn't at all surprising that it still exists. What is, what is continues to amuse me is that most of us don't even notice. Yes, yes. I, um, I, I live in, in, in South Delhi, and once I, I spent an entire night with a friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine, wandering around this part of South Delhi, which is quite large, it has about 4,000 houses, uh, called Greater Kailash. And I, 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 we all had, we had this little note, notebook on which we would, um, if, 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 an, if, if somebody's name allowed us to figure out what caste they were, we would just mark it down. And the amazing thing was that there wasn't a single identifiably lower caste name in all of Greater Kailash. Of the thousands of families that lived there, there wasn't one. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, maybe it doesn't really know we don't really care. And, but to outsiders, um, it can get very, you know, the difference can get very sharp. Because remember that caste is not just, uh, you know, he, as, as the Dravidian movement would say, caste is also about aesthetics, all right? We want fairness. We want a particular kind of northern, sharp-featured look, which is traditionally associated with a bunch of um, upper-caste communities. And the reason that I bring this up is because caste propagates itself in other ways. Okay, we're not talking about what caste we are, but we can look at most people, and when you think, oh yeah, yeah, he looks like people like us, it means that they look recognizably upper caste in a particular way, in an aesthetic kind of way. We look at someone and say, oh, they, you know, they're educated. I've always loved the words. A lot of people who are barely educated are also talked about as educated. They're from a cultured family. All these little phrases that we, have, we hear over and over again mean essentially and effectively the same thing. And the, 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 the simple fact here is that I don't see any solution to the problem of working out how the government should deal with this big division or the state should deal with this, this big division between upper and lower castes in our country why one side has essentially said, oh, the problem doesn't exist. Okay, which is why we fight about reservations. Why do these guys need reservations? Look at them, they're all wealthy, creamy layer. Uh, there's no data to support the creamy layer part. There's anecdotal stuff, but there's no, overall, it doesn't seem to be that reservations help uh, people who are marginally richer than um, other members of the caste that it's targeted towards. That's been the, the product of several uh, major recent studies. and. Yet, it's, it's a myth that we tell ourselves because it makes us feel comfortable. Because we don't think that this division exists at all. Right. Um, and now the last couple of things, um, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. The one, is, and the one that I wanted to talk about was, and it's kind of an odd thing, and I love to hear what people think about this, is I think that we are divided in a way that's not very obvious, and that is, by what I call our attitude to materialism. Now, I'm not going to turn into some kind of strange, crazy spiritualist here. It's something that I, uh, uh, I mean very specifically, which is that we have divisions within ourselves that we don't always talk about as to what the purpose of the Indian state should be. And the reason is that the state and governments in general have trouble trying to work out the value of things that, isn't, uh, things that aren't directly material. Right? We can't exactly value clean air very well. We can't value the environment very well. This is, as I was just saying, this is my first time in Goa for 15 years. Or I used to come every year before that. And this time when I flew in to the, into Dublin and I looked down, I was shocked. Because what used to be a completely green state is now, I mean, it, it, it looks like it's got acne here. It, it, it has these enormous sort of swathes of pink, and which I'm sure pretty much everybody here has seen from the air, or worse, had to walk through. And my point essentially is that that, that environmental questions, where we find ourselves unable to value what our environment is, and therefore we find that our state is unable to value what the environment is, is one of those things that increasingly divides us. In a lot of other societies, there is an understanding that 
okay, this is something that is valuable, this is something that you're willing to pay for, all right? This is something that you're willing to, to have the state protect. We haven't talked about it. It's not part of how we think about ourselves, all right? Even areas that were beautifully pristine, and we in fact worship them because they were beautifully pristine and hard to get to, such as Kedarnaths and you know the four uh, um, tourism, uh, the four sort of pilgrimage sites in Uttarakhand. You look at photographs of them or paintings of them from the 19th century, and the, the point of them is that you have a single temple, all right, standing in pr pristine, unjudged surroundings. And you're supposed to go there and commune with it, uh, you know, commune, you know, think about nature or whatever, right? Look at the places now. Not only do you do you not suffer getting there, you drive half the way and then get airlifted, okay? But once you're there, you have a choice of 15 air-conditioned, or not air-conditioned, heated, uh, plate glass window um, guest houses that overlook the temple, and the entire valley was turned into a something indistinguishable from the rather ugly margins of our cities. And it's not in the least surprising, therefore, that you know, as the environment got, you know, got degraded and topsoil uh, uh, wore away, that the glacier came down and finished it off. Um, the essential problem that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm trying to say here, these are not things that we're talking about ourselves. But we recognize that there are divisions among us, between us, as to how this should work out. There are people who really want to get to Kedarnath easily, and there are people who want it kept the way it is. All right? And it isn't just a division in terms of environment, it's in terms of a bunch of different things. Right? It's about, for example, what should cities be spending money on? Should they be spending money on parks? Should, should they be spending money on flyovers? Both help people, but one is a much more material and immediate benefit than, a, than, than something else. But both are valued by people, but this is not a division between ourselves that we've been able to work out. And the final thing that I want to talk about, which I feel is a difference in how we view each other and how we view India, and that affects how the state is, is age. And I don't mean the age, the age of um, you know, individual people. I mean how old do we think India is? And if you ask most people, um, it's well, well, we have 5,000 year old civilization, all right? All parts of that sentence I can quibble with. Um, but in actual fact, what we are is a 7, 70, 65, 67, 67 year old republic, all right? And these two things are constantly in conflict, I think, and that lies at the heart of so much of what we have trouble with. When we're trying to solve a new problem that crops up, such as, for example, the environmental degradation. What are the principles that we go to? Are there the, are there the principles of the 67-year-old republic, such as we imagine they are? Or are they the principles of the 5,000-year-old civilization, such as whatever we imagine those are? And I think that this question, the first question you should always ask someone when they start talking, and I've done this over and over again, I found it very useful, is, but how old do you think that India is as an idea? And they immediately, you know, what, what the answer tells you a lot about the remaining question, the way that they will answer the remaining questions. If they say 5,000 years, they typically answer in a particular way. If they say, oh, you know, India is basically something that uh, um, uh, um, came into existence in 47, all right, then they answer in a particular way. If they say, well, you know, before the British came, um, we didn't really realize they were Indians, then they answer in a particular way. There's a, there are a bunch of different uh, ways in which your intuitive and instinctive answer to the question of how old India is plays into, and I, and I encourage you to sort of do this little thought experiment for yourselves and try it out on your friends and family. Really, really hard of fun. Thank you for a wide ranging, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I India in terms of divisions, areas that divide us and perhaps unite us. I think the last, your last point in thinking of uh, just in terms of time frameworks is actually very profound. Uh, because if you think about Indian identity, you know, are you an Indian? What does Indian identity mean actually is a core issue. So maybe we can start with that with you in terms of, is there such a thing as an Indian identity? And could you elaborate? 
Well, it's, it's sort of very tough to imagine that there is something because I don't think any of us would easily agree on it. Um, you know, I'd go so far as to say maybe the only thing is, I don't know, the cricket team. Uh, and I wish I was joking, but the truth is that, you know, it's the first thing that people turn against in parts of the country where they don't feel Indian anymore. Is, uh, you know, I've been in, in Kashmir when there's been an India-Australia match, and nobody has a good word to say for the Australians in Srinagar, but they're sharing them. Alright, and so yes, there's, you have to try and figure out exactly what it is. I, I have no clear answer to what uh, Indian identity is. Um, people have different answers. By and large, you you know remember you have let let me try let me you know really sort of logical about this. You have to have something that by and large people who think they're Indian share have in common, all right. But things that, for example, Bangladeshis or Pakistanis or NRIs would not or you know, people who are you know, who do not necessarily think of themselves as Indian anymore. And I don't think there's any any one answer to that. In fact, you know, is there an Indian identity? I don't think so. I mean there are there are there are fuzzy borders, you know, with other parts of the world and people who don't think of themselves as Indian anymore. Which means that it's not that easy for us in particular. I'm going to ask a couple more questions and throw it over to the audience. Second question. Uh, you've written about, in different ways, and Ashutosh Varshi's book was about democracy, and in a way your divisions also touches upon how to manage a state, or uh, uh, and whether it's the tensions between the center and the state, or in terms of religion, and whether it's the business of the Supreme Court to dictate your definition of Hindu or religion, etc. What do you see as the great dangers to Indian democracy? Or are they? You know, it's, I think in, 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 in most countries like ours, it's very difficult to imagine there could be dangers uh, um, to something that we take for granted, which is voting and some basic freedoms. Uh, but whenever I tell, whenever I think of this, which I think is easy, I always remind myself of the emergency. All right, and which I did not live through, but. It exists. I mean, there was a time when it seemed that we had become, to all intents and purposes, like any other third world country, which had, you know, which was going to have one party state and one leader for life, and, you know, and policies dictated from top down, firmly, etc. And that came really easily. It came even within the constitutional structure of the of the uh, of the state. Practically, we voted someone named with a massive majority, and then used it in a particular way, and. It's, it's not that difficult for the basic things that we take for granted to break down. And the greatest threats right now are, are threefold, I think. One is a kind of elite disillusionment with democracy, which is, which is to say that I don't believe that other people use their votes properly, all right? So people in South India, they get, you know, they vote for parties on the basis of mixies and saris. And, you know, all these poor people vote for saris because they vote for parties because they're given alcohol and bribes. I am voting for someone because he's going to give me 50% off on my, on my Bishri bill. That's a completely different thing. <laughs> all right? So, so there is a particular kind of elite idea that, look, Democracy is not working, and they never add four hours, <coughs> all right? But they just say democracy is not working. The second is something that I feel exists across, it's not just an elite phenomenon, but there is this feeling that democracy is all very well, but ours is too diverse a country to allow in so many people veto power. And, you know, you need somebody like, and you hear this over and over again, you know, like Indira Gandhi, all right? When Indira Gandhi was around, then there were none of these problems, which, of course, I strongly doubt. Um, but in any case, even if there were these problems, a lot of people weren't talking about them, all right? Because they were terrified of Indira Gandhi. Uh, so while Indira Gandhi was around, uh, 
But in our mental, in our mental image, we have this thing of we need another Indira Gandhi. And you know, there are some Indira Gandhi's on offer today. <laughs> All right. And yeah. So uh, oddly enough, not Dev Gandhi. But uh, so it's it's. I I feel that there are quite few of them on offer actually, and I feel that that is a bit another dangerous thing. And final danger to democracy. I genuinely believe is the fact that we haven't worked at widening it enough and taking it to the margins of the country, which is, you know, across the northeast, um, across cent you know central India, you know, in in Kashmir and in Sikkim, all these places, there are people who don't feel invested enough in a liberal democratic notion of what India is, and. That is not entirely their fault. In fact, it's not even slightly their fault in many ways. It's because, you know, I, I'll give you one example of uh, how this creeps into the thinking of even people who run uh, the state. The chief of army staff five years ago was asked by someone, by a, by a journalist, do you want to, um, will the army start fighting the nationalists? So he said, no, no, see, the army can go into the northeast and to Jammu and Kashmir, but we can't fight our own people. They said this on national television. And very, very few people remarked on it at the time. But it's a very, very clear idea that, okay, the margins are not, we don't, if we don't treat them like standard Indians, then they won't really be their standard Indians. So I think that that is one major threat to them because the limits of Thank you. We actually we found that in our own study, particularly in Assam, mm -hmm. uh, which we're yeah, compared to the other states. Yeah, oh, yeah. The racism that's emerging in terms of how we treat, uh, I mean, how relevant or how prevalent color bias is amongst us, as well as facial bias, facial features bias. That we talked about. My last question. Uh, you, you've written in an earlier article where you talk about uh, freedom of speech and you say there is no free religion without free speech. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, what I was trying to say was, in many ways, and this is, a, this is linked to what the point that I made earlier about um, separating the state and religion, trying to get the state to ignore religion. It's not just to protect the state, but it is to protect religion. And in order to be able to think freely about religious matters and believe freely, you have to you have to be able to say what you want and to talk to people about what it is that you believe and what it is that you believe your religion is, what it is you believe all religions are, without feeling constrained in any way. And particularly not constrained by threats of violence. And in many ways, I think that the freedom of speech, the, the context in which I made this remark was about the recent um, decision by a major publisher, Penguin. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about this, but uh, everybody's heard of it. Penguin decided to uh, withdraw a book published by a fairly well-known um, um, scholar named Wendy Doniger who's been studying Hinduism and certain aspects of Hinduism for many decades now. And they withdrew the book because they were fighting a case in um, a, a court in Delhi that a lot of people had, had launched against this book because they said it was, it violated certain provisions of the law um, by being offensive to Hindus. Now, the book, and Ms. Doniger's work in general is about those aspects, now, without necessarily saying it's good or bad, um, but this is what the project is, this is what she's trying to do. What she's trying to do is saying that there are various different forms of Hinduism that exist, um, some of which are a lot more earthy and, um, you know, uh, than, than we in the middle class like to think about. And 
these are living traditions in many parts of the country. You know, in Bengal, you know, it, it, the, Tantra is not like a strange kind of yoga. Right? In, 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 where in the state that I come from, it's an actual form of sacrificial, much more. Uh, it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't feel middle class. You get blood on your hands. All right. You get blood on your forehead. It's. It's. It's not. Uh, um, and ordinary people. I think people like me. I mean, I live down the road from Kalidhar Temple, where you know five thousand goats are killed every day. And um, that's the number one place of pilgrimage in my in my state. Um, you know, all of us have at times of various pujas have um, put blood all over ourselves. It's it's the way that the religion exists in my state, and it's it 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 makes a lot of other people who are call themselves Hindus deeply uncomfortable. But there are you know various different ways in which Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and Christians have. Um, have practiced these religions, but if suddenly you you are not allowed to say that this is the kind of way in which some people practice their religion, this is this is also what it means to be religious, or this is also what it means to be Hindu. If you are not allowed to say this, where is the freedom of religion of the people who practice religion? I think that's, that's the thing. Okay, just to follow up on that, I think your suggestion of uh uh, organizing, perhaps you didn't say that. And, and maybe I should turn that into a question. Why do you think that the liberal or the intellectual class or those who believe strongly in freedom of speech and expression, why haven't they organized to challenge uh, Section 295, which is the part of the Indian uh, uh, Code uh, which focuses on hurt sentiment? You know, this uh, section 295 is, as I said, one of those fascinating holdovers from the way that the British used to run us. Um, it's not something that you'll find in any non-colonial law. It's something that's very, very specific. It, it exists so that your local I, ICS district magistrate guy will go and say, oh, some neighbor, sir. All right, and you know, you know, you Muslims are always fighting with you Hindus, you Hindus are always fighting with you. Don't be mean to each other or they'll lock you up. All right, that was the purpose behind it. And we have now taken it, you know, it's, it's become a, an unquestioned part of our own civil court, saying that you cannot print or say anything that offends the sentiments of any religious group. Now, of course, and there are so many parts of that thing that are problematic. It's sort of who decides what is offensive, what are sentiments, what groups, you know, can anything be a religious group, etc., etc. But why the why we haven't you know when I say we I mean those of us who think that we are broadly liberal and care about these things haven't organized against it? Well, one very good answer came in um, you know at the time of the Jaipur Literature Festival a few years ago when um, it was almost shut down because they had invited Salman Rushdie, and the fascinating thing about it was that these matters of religion divide even basically agnostic or atheistic liberal types. And it is that it's a division that a lot of, I think a lot of people have picked up from the West, where there is an exaggerated deference towards other people who believe. It's sort of it's okay for for people in America to you know, loudly proclaim, for example, their, the fact that their state is completely separate from their, uh, uh, from their churches. But they would never dream of saying that this is how, for a lot of them, would never dream of saying that this is how the rest of the world should also be. And a lot of us are American inside in that way, which is that we've picked up this thing that, okay, you have to respect the believer. All right, that is the primary thing. You can't, if you, it's, not, it's not that you know you believe what you want. I am free to believe what I want. We say what we both of us say what we want. It we also have to have this respect for difference, which goes around. Okay, I'm also going to make sure that you have a veto power about what I say, and I have a veto power about what you say. And 
that is something that I think comes from a very sort of modern and almost an academic left kind of approach to the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, the very, very interesting and of course takes us back to uh, lives as we experience, politics, democracy, who we are. So the floor is open for questions, comments. As far as uh, Kashmir is concerned, <coughs> see, Pakistan is fighting a proxy war through that. So therefore, presence of army or employment of army was quite justified. And so is, to some extent, the Northeast, because China, through Burma, wants to instigate. In Naxal, it was totally different. So this was just, I thought I, I, I shared that. My question is, in last uh, couple of years, so many scams took place in India. One the glaring CWG, 75,000 crores, and I come from Delhi. Today you just go and see, it has just gone down the drain. Very, very senior leader saying that Kajriwal is just trying to catch these petty people. Now, the pain of petty people is not understood by these people. They are only thinking unless it's a scam of 3,000, 30,000 crores. A Amar B party came up. But it looks to me that it was crushed very badly by those forces which do not, they want this whole thing to continue this way. Yesterday, looking at the, or watching the TV, when you had in UP assembly people taking out you know, doing those drama baj people. In uh, Jammu and Kashmir, chap was slapping. In Delhi, you saw. Are we at that stage, or what is the solution to all this? That is what my question is. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, I, I, I sort of look, if you don't mind, I'll take it sort of one by one. Um, on the question of sort of big corruption, small corruption, and so on and so forth, you are right to a degree that there is a certain sense that is prevalent across the bureaucratic and political class that we need to do this. Um, politicians that I have seen talk in unguarded moments, a lot of politicians don't necessarily live very lavishly, you know, even if they're very corrupt. Um, our political system is such that you know I was at a, I was at a I was at a, a lunch uh, uh, the other day uh, three days ago or two days ago at the time of Telangana vote being thrown by by an MP from Andhra Pradesh and everyone was talking about uh, about what's going to happen in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and so on and so forth and one of them said that you know actually the Congress is in real trouble not just because of this in Andhra Pradesh. But also because, you know, this chief minister that um, Sonia Gandhi is put in there, he's not earning anything himself, he's not letting anybody else earn anything, and the Congress has no money to fight the elections. And there was this sense of, you know, like, you, you, you picked up that these are guys who are not necessarily, you know, corrupt themselves, all right? They, one of them had come there in a, in a, in a, in a Kali Pili taxi. All right, but it was like this is what I do. This is my life. I I have to you know get from from real estate. I get a large amount of money, which then I use to plow back into my business. All right, to to win my next set of elections because there is no other source of funding in politics. So that's how politicians operate. Bureaucrats will tell you that look, unless you any any form of uh, um, decision can be looked at as corruption now. I benefit any private party, their competitor will come and tell me, their competitor will, or worse, will go and tell the courts or go and tell the CAG, okay, he has signed this uh, folder which benefits so and so people because he was given money, then I have to prove my innocence to the auditor, which is impossible. So there are ways in which it has become structurally embedded in the way that basic policy decisions are taken in this country, which is very hard to get rid of. And if you if you really want, what I think is the only way to change it, is that one, you have to reduce the power of government to take these decisions, these big decisions, 
which I don't think that many people are actually talking about, not even the Anandi party. That's A. And B, frankly, we have to get out of this terrible habit of ours as a country, which is actually, if you want, I, Indian identity, I'll tell you this one. This is Indian identity. The Indian identity is, you know, I am very good, everybody else is bad, what can I do? <laughs> All right? Uh, so, this is, I think, the basic, you know, my neighbor voted for the Amadi party because he was fed up, in, I live in, 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 in Delhi, in Defense College, because he was fed up with all these corrupt people, you know, that's why they have to pay bribe for this, have to pay bribe for this, and I sat there and nodded. Yesterday I was told that he had, he had that, uh, sorry, last week I was told that in that brief period that Mr. Kejriwal was in power and told us we'd have free power up to a certain amount, um, no, sorry, free water up to a certain amount, that he had arranged for extra connections to his house. So he arranged for three visually meters <laughs> and um, one other Pani ka connection that was supposed to be for the local park had been diverted to his, uh, uh, to his house and he said, I will take care of the park water. <laughs> so all I'm saying is that this is, this is how we are as a people. You know, we tend to uh, say, Achha, you know, there's nothing much we can do. So I feel there's a, there's a social change that comes before this kind of political change happens. My name is Lakshman Bhadanani. I'm a, a retiree from London. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Sharma, do you think you might be in danger of missing a trick uh, when you uh, declare or demonstrate an implied bias in favor of urbanization as opposed to uh, the development of villages. I mean, if you listen to this, I listened to Madhav Gandhi only a couple of, days, couple of weeks ago, and I listened to various other economists who feel that really India should try uh, stop copying the West and go for its own solution. You see, and do you not think that people like yourself who were perhaps more under the Harvard influence, uh, and people like me under the English influence, think more of industrialization, because urbanization in India has brought a lot of evils, which we must not forget. And whilst uh, village life may not be idyllic, and I'm sure it's not idyllic, uh, there are compensations, which I would suggest to you, perhaps are greater than the advantages that might accrue. My second question follows from the first, and that is, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, I echo entirely your sentiment about the way we have prosecuted our environment. We really have. And it is not only at the macro level, it's also at the micro level. And when I say macro level, you know, your example of Uttarakhand, Uttarakhand and the hotels coming up there, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's ghastly. But even at the micro level, um, you look at it here in Goa, you know, you, 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 buy, a fl you buy a flat and uh, you have a view of the sea and the next thing that happens to you is the chap in front of you, which is a vacant plot, has built not only a house, but he's built a damn building, which is about seven stories high, and blocked everybody's view. This is also the micro level. See, that we, as Indians, have absolutely no respect for the environment. And when you start removing people like Jaira Ramesh, and you pick, removing people like uh, um, uh, Nathan, you know, uh, people who care a bit about the environment, you're going to get this. You're going to get this at the local level. See. India, in, in, in that sense, we have lost our soul as far as the environment is concerned. Would you have any comments on that? When you, uh, when you have talked about uh, moving into an urban area, I also have, well, I want to disagree with you on that. Because why not turn the rural area? You know, this uh, um, uh, former Abdul um, uh, Talam, mm -hmm. he had this project called Pura, you know, providing urban uh, necessities to rural areas. Urbanizing uh, rural areas. So why not urbanize rural areas? Yeah. As if there's so much of pressure on the cities, you know. Absolutely. We have nobody talks about reverse migration. And when I say reverse migration, is when you turn rural areas, you give all amenities, urban amenities to rural areas. Right. What about that? I actually also had the same question. But let's go to the, yes, please in the back. Actually, what I would also go by what Nandini said, but then uh, there is something that uh, came across to me a lot of, of the past few years that one reason why we do have a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, we're talking about uh, when Mr. Sharma talked about the English education becoming a big thing. 
I, I go spend uh, every month, I spend one day in a village counseling the students. Now the thought process works like this, I need to get a job. I need to get a job. Now this village I'm talking about is a couple of kilometers inside Mangalore. He doesn't even want to go to Mangalore. I have to get a job in the IT. What do I want to do in the IT? I have, I'm absolutely clueless. But it has to be IT. To do that, I need English. So that was one thing. And another thing they feel is that Hindi is necessary because Hindi is a language of power. And what is missing is the need for the local language because of which we've lost our entire value of the local uh, ecosystem, the local histories, whatever. You know, we have lost that kind of... Um, I don't know, the, I'm not getting the right word, you know, the, the thing saying that, okay, this is mine, I need to protect it, I need to nurture it. That whole identity. thought process, yeah, identity, that whole thought process is gone. So the last couple of times we tried, like, of course, we, we are not into um, building up towns, but we did try to look at telling the students, why don't you look at local entrepreneurship? They have come up with some things. So out of the batch of the 12th standard, where we had 40% students going out, this time we had 30% students going out. <laughs> Even that 10 was the same year. But maybe that's what we need to look at. I don't know. It's just a... Thank you very much. Anybody else? Please. We'll take two more there. Uh, talking about uh, the religion and the state. See, we have ourselves put a stamp for its differences by making different laws for different religions. Like our Hindu act, Muslim act, Indian personal law for different things. And the directive principle that we have said of Dr. Ambedkar is that we should try to have one unified civil code for the full country. Now only in Goa, if many people don't know, we have one civil code. Family laws, divorce laws, marriage laws, hereditary laws, all come under one code. And Goa, I feel, is the only place throughout India where we have the least problems between Hindus, Muslims and Catholics. They live all together. They'll be in the club, Hindus, Muslim, Catholic together. The rest of India was burning with communal problems. There was not even one slap in Goa against one another. I feel this is the thing which should be projected to the whole of India. It has worked so beautifully in Goa Unified Civil Court. It's there in the directive principles also. In fact, when once when uh, Chief Justice Chandra Chud had come to inaugurate the High Court, he commented that what is envisaged in the Constitution of India, Goa has fulfilled it. Thank you. There is no chance for correction of these wrong but it, most of people are thinking like us, sir. Tell everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, there's one last question. Maybe there, let me start. Um, corruption. Could you introduce the is, is being branded Melsa Vaz Montero. I'm uh, at present part of the Council for Social Justice and Peace. Um, what I'm saying is corruption is being kicked around like a ball on a football ground. Basically, corruption is in the mind and heart of every human person. Now, First, the human person is a spirit. Spirituality is the basis of the life, whatever your religion. Religion, when you grow up and reason out, is if you follow the tenets of your religion, they are all based on common spirituality. I would like any person, even an agnostic, to tell me that there is no West, there is no thing as the spirit. And 
if there is a spirit in every human being, that person is, the foundation of that person is spirituality. Now, whether we are professionals or we are laborers, whatever we are, and let me tell you at the basic level in Goa, a laborer has more spirituality to tell, to teach me in daily life than all of us who go around preaching spirituality and religion. Thank you. Now the question is, in uh, India, or even in Goa, you know, how and who makes all of us realize that this is the basis of our life. Thank you. I'm afraid I, I don't really have an answer to that. It's a tough question. Thank you. Thank you again very much and thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions, your comments, very diverse. And a lot of food for thought and thank you Mihir for coming and sharing your thoughts. Continue writing provocative columns. <laughs> they do get read. And they do make a difference. And uh, thank you Nandani for hosting and bringing in here. Thank you Deepa for coming so graciously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks and, everyone. And, and this is a small joke. Oh, thank you. This is thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, it's been great fun.